Uh, yeah, I met my wife uh, during that time off, and um, we uh, started dating and fell in love very quickly and got engaged within nine months and married within a year, and so... There's a certain magnetism surrounding Pete Sampras, one that propelled him from being an ordinary boy in Potomac, Maryland, to a household name around the world. Let me tell you, when Pete swings a racket, the world stops to watch. Well, what about... ah! But what about the guy behind the racket? Who are the people he goes home to after his matches? Let's journey into the world off the tennis court and get a glimpse into the Sampras' clan. Also, make sure you stay till the end to find out why Sampras felt relief after losing in the quarterfinals of the US Open. The answer might surprise you. And as always, if this video serves up some tennis joy, follow that like button and backhand a subscribe for more ace-worthy tennis content like this. More than 90% of you amazing spectators are aren't subscribed yet, so give it a click and let's get you on our tennis loving team. Our story begins with the couple Sammy and Georgia Sampras. Sammy, born and bred in America to Greek parents, and Georgia, a Spartan by birth, moved to America when she was just three. Together, they set the stage for what would become one of the most remarkable journeys in tennis history. Now imagine a three-year-old Pete discovering a dusty tennis racket in the family's basement. The moment his tiny hands grasped the racket, it was as if he was born for it. The basement walls became his first opponent, as he'd spend countless hours striking balls against them. By the way, Pete was the third of four children, so you can imagine the soundtrack of the Sampras household, a symphony of laughter, chatter, and tennis balls hitting the walls. Stella, Marion, and Gus are the other members of the Sampras quartet. Each has their life path. Stella is a tennis coach for college students. Gus is a tennis tournament director and a business manager, and Marion found her calling as a teacher. Clearly, the love for tennis runs deep in the Sampras family veins. In September 2000, Pete decided it was game, set, match when he tied the knot with Bridget Wilson. Bridget, a small town girl from Gold Beach, Oregon, was no stranger to the limelight. Crowned Miss Teen USA in 1990, she then plunged into Hollywood, starring in 90s hits such as Saved by the Bell and Mortal Kombat. The moment I saw her at a movie premiere, I just knew I had to meet her. Pete would recount years later. He did more than meet her, he won her heart. Together, Pete and Bridget are raising two sons, Christian Charles and Ryan Nicholas. In the Sampras household, the best love is the kind that awakens the soul and makes us reach for more. And you can bet that Pete and Bridget strive to instill this in their boys. As one of the top dogs in the tennis world, Pete raked in millions from his career and various endorsements. Who knew that hitting a tiny ball with a racket could buy you such a lifestyle, Pete once joked. He signed a lucrative deal with Nike, but it didn't stop there. Clothing, racket endorsements, and even partnerships with Pizza Hut and Dannon followed. He was no stranger to the world of sponsorships. The earnings from his career allowed Pete and his family to live in the lap of luxury. Their abode, worth a cool $25 million, is nestled in Lake Sherwood, California. It's a palace fit for a king, Pete quips about their home, complete with stone and wood flooring, a sprawling guest area, and an in-house gym. Not to mention the tennis court. Of course there's a tennis court. Pete's love for luxury extends beyond houses to his collection of automobiles. The pride and joy of his collection is a custom-built Porsche 911 Turbo S. It's more than a car. It's a work of art, he often says, clearly in love with his ride. But the Sampras' lifestyle isn't just about the glitz and glamour. Pete is heavily involved in charitable activities. He established the Aces for Charity Foundation in 1997, a beautiful testament to his generosity. For every ace he served, 
he donated $100. By 1999, he doubled the amount, showing his deep commitment to give back. Within three years, Pete, along with sponsors and supporters, had raised about $1 million. What's more admirable? The money raised wasn't funneled into building grand monuments or ostentatious shows of philanthropy. No, it was discreetly put to work where it mattered most in the lives of those less fortunate. And that's not all. Pete is also a board member of the Tim and Tom Gullickson Foundation, named in honor of his former coach, Timothy Ernest Gullickson, who succumbed to brain cancer in 1996. The foundation aims to support patients and families dealing with the ravages of the disease. In March 2000, Pete hosted the Pete Sampras Classic, an event attended by Hollywood stars, renowned sports people, and media celebrities. The gathering raised over $90,000 for the foundation, proving that Pete's influence stretched beyond just tennis courts. In 2002, Pete and his wife joined hands with other celebrities for an ad campaign conducted by Ford Motors for breast cancer awareness. The campaign sold limited edition red scarves and the proceeds from the sales were donated to the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. These initiatives paint a picture of a man who used his fame and fortune to make a difference in the world. So there you have it folks, the life and times of Pete Sampras, the legend from the dusty basement of his childhood home to the green grass of Wimbledon to the heart of charity work. It's a story of passion, resilience, family, love and generosity. A narrative that goes far beyond just the game of tennis. And now it's time to revisit the question of the day. Why did Sampras feel relief after losing in the quarterfinals of the US Open? Let me paint a picture for you. It's 1991 and Pete Slamin Sampras, our reigning US Open champion and all-around tennis maestro, drops a truth bomb that rocked the sporty world to its very core. Fresh off a crushing defeat in the quarterfinals of the tournament, our boy Pete did the unthinkable. He did not weep, wail or gnash his teeth. Instead, he shrugged off the loss publicly stating he felt a tidal wave of relief, not the gut punch of disappointment we all assumed was the only appropriate response to defeat. The tennis fandom erupted in shock. What? No crushing sadness, no wallowing in defeat. He's happy to drop the shiny trophy. Preposterous, after all. The script clearly states that athletes must always hunger for victory like ravenous wolves and take defeat like they've been slapped in the face with a soggy fish. But no, not our Pete. He seemed all too chuffed to bid goodbye to the crushing weight of defending his title. A sentiment so rare, it's like spotting a unicorn wearing a tutu. Pete's blasphemous confession drew the ear of fellow tennis knights, Jim Take It Seriously Courier, and Jimmy Can't Believe It Connors, who saw this unusual chillness as some form of sacrilege against the holy grail of competition. But come on, cut the guy some slack. Let's face it, the constant expectation of being the biggest, baddest, bestest champ can be a heavier burden than trying to explain the plot of Inception to a five-year-old. Pete's hallelujah moment post-defeat shows that the weight of expectation was akin to carrying a backpack full of anvils while trying to play top-class tennis. So, what's the moral of this tale? Well, sports isn't just about crushing your opponents into the dust and chugging champagne from shiny trophies. It's also about navigating the emotional roller coaster that accompanies victory and defeat. It highlights the importance of mental well being in sports, which often gets overlooked in favour of the latest on court dramas or hilarious mascot fails. And that, my friends, is game, set, and match for this episode of Glam Slam Tennis. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss a moment of the action and what we have in store. Until next time, stay fabulous and ace those serves.